That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a writer giving a talk about the different kinds of writing that the audience might want to try doing. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. So I'm now going to say a few words about the various different kinds of writing you may want to consider. Each has its own challenges and rewards, and it's really a question of seeing what suits you best. There are no rights and wrongs here. Let's start by considering the short story. Remember that a short story isn't just a very concise novel. There are three basic styles. The story itself, the slice of life section, and the surprise type, and all of them are equally valid as treatments of the genre. When producing a short story, you don't have time for a slow build-up of interest, so you need to get in there straight away and begin with a crisis. Then there's non-fiction, which can sell very well, with biographies in particular frequently hitting the bestseller lists. It's important, however, to be sure your chosen topic is genuinely interesting to people, and you know enough about it to do it justice. So when you're submitting your idea to a publisher, it's worthwhile to give them details of specialist knowledge you have. What about articles? Now, this is a very wide area, of course, going from the very learned and obscure to the populist gossip type. Articles based on giving advice are a proven area, and to give them a sufficient focus, you should produce your article for a definite market. That will help to define your purpose. Turning to something different, there's the question of poetry. It's often hard to define what poetry is exactly. Maybe it's easier to say what it isn't. But it should be subtle, so the message of a poem oughtn't to be overly obvious. True poems let the ideas sit there for the reader to ponder. What they must do is sound good, like singing. So I recommend reading what you write aloud to yourself to check the melody. Well, then there's plays, which are basically novels, but told only through conversation. A playwright includes minimal instructions for actions, but not for every small action the actors will perform. Things such as moves towards sofa and so on are for the director to come up with. If you're thinking of trying your hand at a play, a good starting point would be to educate yourself a little in the art of acting, so that you know what the people who deliver your work can and can't do with it. What next? There's radio, of course. Radio uses an enormous range of material, and the BBC Writing for Radio Handbook contains information about all of this. To begin with, I suggest regional stations for sending your stuff to, the competition for national radio is extremely high. OK, another interesting area is children's literature. Now, very few, if any, children's books are published without pictures. But this doesn't mean that you, as writer, have to draw them. That's for the illustrator. What you do need to do is be clear who you want to write for. So, 
fix on one age group and then aim your stories at that. Right, I've saved what I consider to be the best and the hardest till last, the novel. Very long and very difficult to do well, but certainly not impossible, as any bookshop shelves will confirm. One of the first things to decide is from what point of view you will tell your story. A popular choice is the first person, and this technique certainly gives a sense of immediacy for the reader, while many new writers find it easier to project themselves into their main character if they can write in his or her name. But that assumes, of course, that the main character is somehow like the writer, which may or may not be the case. Meanwhile, if your book is all narrated by I, you can only put into your story things which are experienced by that character, which may prove to be rather restricting. Now, there are all sorts of pitfalls for the novelist, and many of them relate to the issue of providing a balanced narrative. Every time you introduce a character into the story, you have decisions to make. Of course, you want to populate your landscape with a variety of people to maintain interest, but don't feel you have to decorate every one of them in elaborate detail. The same goes for irony. All too often, an inexperienced writer will create a strong ironic situation and then spoil it by spelling out what they mean by it, as if readers were too stupid to understand. A few contrasting details should serve to make the point clear. A big challenge for new novelists is dialogue. What is the relationship between conversation as people really speak and as it is in novels? Well, it depends. If you recorded actual conversations and copied them straight into your narrative, readers would get confused and bored, all those unfinished sentences going nowhere. On the other hand, you don't want to write out page-long utterances by characters, as these will seem unrealistic to an extreme, but you can insert minor descriptions and actions to vary the pace and add interest. Well, I hope what I'm saying is encouraging and not too off-putting about the various difficulties. Are there any questions at this point? That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.